I've got a slightly better soil triangle picture here just to explain about the increase in clay and increasing silt. You can see there the, on the green line, same triangle again, but the uh, green line is showing that at 50% give or take clay before you get into heavy soil. And I'd say they're quite unusual, and yet most farmers think they have them. Once we've got that, uh, we've now um, can assess, that's the basic risk assessment. Um, and, um, and from that, in the guidance book, again, we would have a, a texturing system such as this, or a risk assessment such as this. And if you go along the bottom line there, it says baseline soil rating, risk rating. You can see light and soil, light soils are, are heavy. The medium soils are moderate, and the heavy soils are high. And within that, there are risks to the various um, potential problems that are on the farm, rated as high, low, or medium. Um, that, that particular table is in the guidance notes again. From all that, you then have to complete a risk record. And the risk record is either can be done as either as a map or as a table. And I would recommend quite strongly that actually um, it's done as a table because it's actually probably easier to complete than the map. The map is fine, it can be done, but you need to be quite specific as to the areas of risk you've got on the over each individual field. If you use a table, what you have to do is to actually fill the table in, uh, risking, and you can see here with the table, that where we've got light soils, it says high risk, uh, as, it as, sorry, as it does for the heavy soils and peaty soils. But now let's concentrate on the medium soils, because the medium soils are actually 80% of uh, most soils in the country, so therefore are associated with most people. And you can see in the example here, what you then need to do is upgrade fields from a moderate risk to a high risk situation. To do this, you need to take into account the risk of a field generating a problem. You can see, for example, risk of soil on road uh, as being an example on, on the first field. This becomes quite important from the point of view of uh, insurance documentation as well. Because from the insurance point of view, we need to actually be able to say that um, fr from that situation that we've basically got uh, this particular field potentially could cause a problem. These need to be identified. If they're not identified correctly, then should a problem occur, you may find that uh, from the point of view of insurance, you've got a problem because you haven't identified this as a, as a risk and therefore there's no due diligence to it. There is no real problem about uh, identifying the risk because all, what you're going to be then doing is in putting in more options to actually uh, a, a, a accommodate that risk you've now got, which I'll come to a bit later on. So just to summarise on the table, what you do is with the moderate and high risk, you identify uh, the fields by the field number. Defra has said, please can you use uh, field numbers and not field names. And then where you are uprating it, you put the reason in why you've uprated that particular field. Um, using the table, the third column across, um, which is e examples of um, what, can, what problems can occur, is actually pre-populated for you. So um, whereas if you use the map, you have to explain what are the problems of that particular field. So having got our risk, We then uh, have to um, I, um, identify the, how we're going to manage that risk. And that's done by uh, step three, where we're looking at the uh, soil protection review in terms of the seals, the, uh, and we look at the seals page here. And you can see straight away on the, f on, on the first of the two serial pages, which is uh, uh, page 18 in the book, that um, it says under high risk fields there, numbers one and two, whereas on the medium risk fields, or it says um, uh, number one. And that's saying that in a high risk situation, we need to identify two options uh, that are you, what the farmer's prepared to carry out. The options uh, are identified in the tick box page in the, on the adjacent page, page uh, 15, sorry, 
page 13. Of, uh, sorry, make sure I've got the right number wrong. Page 19, I beg your pardon, where there are tick boxes. And um, you would choose the options. Now, if you read across the top of the tick boxes there, it says relieves compaction, relieves runoff, uh, prevents poaching, etc. Uh, clearly, we need to have identified those as an issue, back to step one, in the first place, to be able to uh, use those particular options at this point. So, for instance, if you say you do not get runoff or erosion, then you can't use the, the boxes which uh, identify those options uh, at this point. So, having decided on the options, let's just say we have choose A1 and A2 for the purposes of, of the plan. Then we go back to page um, 18, and on the, where it says high risk numbers 1 and 2, you enter against that A1 and A2 or whatever choices you've made. In subsequent years, you then actually uh, alter that. Uh, you review it every annually every year. And so in the 2011 annual review, which you do at the end of 2011, you would either, if there's been no extra problems, you carry on with what you're doing if you're happy with that practice, or you review it and change your practices and choose other options as you see fit. And so that's basically how one ad adjusts, adjusts the high-risk land. Now, if one looks at the series of options, we've all got big smiles on our faces at the moment because, yeah, we can manage all those options. They're not particularly difficult. And uh, from the point of the cereal crop, it's not a problem. However, as one turns over the pages for potatoes and for maize, the option and outdoor pigs and so on, the options get very much more difficult. Not only that, the number of options you need to take on high-risk fields increase. So, for instance, for the maize crop, you've got to have three options, and all options under the maize uh, cropping system are actually quite difficult to achieve in its own right. Um, if we look at the, if we carry on towards the back and look at the grassland page, uh, which is on page uh, 36 for improved grassland. Give an example here. Um, this is, again, not, not too difficult to achieve, but I do want to flag up a couple of problems here now. The first thing is the actual heading. Can you see it says improved grass and including equine. And including equine means that basically horses now count. Horses are recognised as an issue. And because uh, the soil protection review is across the whole of the holding, irrespective of you, whether you're claiming for that land or not, it means that land which is in your holding, but for instance is uh, under a stabling system, would now count in terms of soil protection review. And so therefore, you need to make sure that whoever's taking on the, is, is renting the horse, the, the grass for horses, is going to be able to follow the options you've chosen. And it can become quite an option because for the horse guys, it is a greater issue as we go along. Uh, on page 38, similarly, we have natural, uh, natural and semi-natural grassland, very similar to the, the improved grassland, except on this page, we're now looking at grassland, which is basically not uh, fertilised, mucked, or sprayed. Just one more page to look at before we move on uh, to other things, but I want to just flag up page 42, which is land not in agricultural production. Uh, here, this is land which is not being cropped, um, and in this situation, um, we will again we have to enter into the soil protection review. Again, it can be land which is not being claimed for, it still needs to be entered here. Um, and it's worth bearing a note, just on a, on a slight side situation, that if you are claiming for OT2 land, which one ought to from the point of view of, uh, the, of the campaign from farm and environment, if you're doing that, then uh, that OT2 land needs to be registered at this point as well. 